Advent of the Great Darkness, 1. Hmm. Oh look, Shenong's still alive. It has been some time since Shenong left Penitentia to work as a school physician at Shinjuku Academy. Around the time of Shenong's transfer, a teacher by the name of Mononobe suddenly went on leave, causing quite a bit of turmoil and confusion within the academy. Shenong and the other teachers have had to work hard to fill the void left by his absence. They take turns giving guidance, lending an ear to the students' troubles, and doing what they can to bring some normalcy back to the academy. Shenong's weekdays are spent helping ill and troubled students, while his weekends are taken up by preparations for the following days of the week. Though he knows that war will engulf all of Tokyo someday soon, Shenong is determined to protect these daily routines for as long as he is able. There it's in. Shenong whispers the name of the student who helped bring about his transfer to Shinjuku Academy. He wonders if he shouldn't take a few of his dear students and flee the city before chaos arrives. He might be able to save a student or two. Moratobai! But not everyone. The thought fills him with despair. It's very likely that there will be casualties. I just don't know what to do. Who can say what's right or wrong in a situation like this? Shenong was formerly the doctor of Penitentia Academy, the forward base of the warmongers. Doctors are considered high-ranking officials within military organizations. Some even possess the authority to discharge officers from their posts if they deem it medically necessary. As such, he was privy to many of the strategies the warmongers had planned, albeit not to the same extent as the guild's executive officers. Operation Mahakala Shenong whispers this phrase to himself as he allows his gaze to travel across the cityscape of West Shinjuku to the eastern sky beyond the, yeah, the Yamanote line. The wall stretching several kilometers north from East Shinjuku sections off the city. And beyond that wall, the battle of the three true guilds surely rages, even now. Shenong knows that this battlefield is to be used as the testing grounds for the warmonger's ultimate weapon. I have told you of this, and yet you still wish to get involved with the events of tr uh, transpiring within that wall. Being a triple agent is a very precarious position to put yourself in, Dr. Miniaki. <laughs> True. But I still see myself as nothing more than a Yogi Academy sport physician. I am an earnest man at heart. I would have preferred to go underground, keep a low profile, but apparently one of my colleagues has gotten themselves into a bit of hot water. Hmm, is he referring to Mononobe? Probably. If not him, then... I mean, it can't be Mononobe. He's in a different class entirely. Maybe he's referring to uh, Azazel. Oh, by class, I mean school. Perhaps you would lend me a hand, Dr. Shenong. Miniaki's sacred artifact, his prosthetic eye, appears to glitter in its socket as he appeals to Shenong. Ah! Veins coursing with a blistering fury, Shiva rushes through the battlefield in search of someone to unleash his anger upon. With every swing of his fists, a building collapses, turning Ikebukuro's main street into desolate plain. Throughout countless loops, Shiva's unswerving dedication to his training has kept this ferocity contained. Yet now a single arrowhead has stirred the rage from within him to life. It burns through Shiva's veins like an inferno, untamable and unquenchable. Why, Varuna Kamadeva, why have you done this to me? Naturally, Shiva was aware of the other Deva's intentions. They had sought to force the role of sustaining Deva Loka's cycle of reincarnation upon him. But Shiva refused this, training an austerity role that he desired. 
yet never wanted to dedicate himself to the world or to get involved with the lives of others. And so he allowed Varuna Kamadeva to receive the rule of desire in his place. Varuna Kamadeva was forced to take on the system of reincarnation instead of him. Shiva understood all this. All that had transpired in his own world was plain to him, except for one thing. Why had Varuna Kamadeva taken part in their plot? Or this Deva, who had once possessed omnipotence, went on to relinquish one rule after another. With every rule abandoned, faith in Varuna Kamadeva was lost, and so only the rule of desire remained. Were this last rule to be relinquished as well, every single rule Varuna Kamadeva was supposed to fill, fill in that world would be lost. You see, so he was kind of a, the pillar of the world at the time, housing multiple worlds and rules. Uh, and sustain their belief system. Yes, Varuna. Varuna being, I'm pretty sure, the, the, one of the protagonist souls. I believe uh, Makara called uh, us uh, Varuna one time in uh, one of his uh, special quests. And the world does not accept those without a role. A total loss of face would cause Varuna Kamadeva to fade from existence. In other words, Varuna Kamadeva was destined to disappear even without she was Serdai making it so. So then, why? And how was he supposed to deal with it? What was he meant to do with the unsuppressible agitation pounding through his veins? <laughs> Shiva's approaching! Retreat! Retreat! Two executive officers of the rule makers from the east watched the battle unfold from their elevated vantage point. Well, here we are. We shall soon get to the bottom of all this talk of the Warmonger's so called ultimate weapon. Matarasu, what do you make of the chaotic state of this battlefield and, in particular, of Shiva's condition? Hmm, I have never seen him in a rampage with such ferocity and any loop to date. This is reminiscent of my younger brother. How awful. My apologies. I nearly lost myself in my dismay. I must admit, she was very powerful, but he is yet to accept his role. A fair point, Amaterasu. I see what you mean. Even now, Shiva adamantly rejects his given role. This is why he cannot exercise his true role. He is somewhat of a threat, as he has been in previous loops, but he is by no means the decisive factor that will tip the seals among the three true guilds. At least, he won't be if he remains like this. So Shiva has some sort of power that he's not letting himself use. There's Mahakala and his bootylicious bod. <laughs> the exception, Mahakala, hovers over Kabukicho. Yet their ghostly transparency is such that they might have been a hologram. They are so ethereal that their very existence appears uncertain. Yogsothoth, Thor, Fisher King, uh, Yukimura, and uh, Sean Dark. Well, uh, Orleans, something like that. You have encountered exceptions before, all of them with immensely powerful beings imbued, imbued with sparkling light of infinite rules. However, there is something very different about this one. Its presence in this world is somehow even more unstable. Well, its presence should only be permitted by the clouds above them, so that's a bit odd. Hmm. Temujin of the Southern Invaders look on from a distance. <laughs> so that's what the ultimate weapon in the Warmongers have been working on. Ah, Perrin. You've arrived, I see. It certainly seems that way. But let me fill you in on the current situation. Temujin begins to explain what has transpired to the transient who joined them at his post. Countless individuals who are barred from transferring to this Tokyo have been sealed in a labyrinth deep beneath the city. Hmm. Sealed in a labyrinth deep. Are they referring to the Ikabukura labyrinth? Oh. Is that a labyrinth? It's a Coliseum, right? Might be both. 
But this is a Shinjuku word in Kabukicho, right? So it shouldn't be nearby. I'm not sure. Apparently, these beings cannot manifest in areas where meaningful information, that is, light, can be found. The guild masters of the three true guilds seem to think it's the app that prevents these individuals from accessing their rules. So, what the warmongers have done is extend the boundaries of the subterranean labyrinth above ground, I see. So what we saw earlier was part of the labyrinth inside the warmongers base. They filled the air with the same material of which the walls of the labyrinths are composed, sealing the area off from the sky. Uh, the walls are made of moon dust. Um, I know they said something about sacred artifacts being made of dark matter. I'm not sure if that's related. This created a battle zone that extends from the underground to the surface, allowing the shadow of that exception to manifest. Now there they are, personality intact with the cognizance to maintain a conversation. The warmongers have succeeded in this. They truly have. But my question is, what's next? Exceptions can only gain strength by becoming a receptacle for misplaced rules and receiving their infinite power. Without this, an exception is a little more than a ghost. However, if the exception does receive these infinite powers, they will instead become a flawed weapon, wreaking havoc upon friend and foe alike. On the other hand, we have Shiva, whose inability to wield his rule is due to his refusal to accept his role. And on the other hand, there's Mahakala, who doesn't have a role since they've been stripped of their rule. Uh huh? Are they planning to combine them or something? Um, hmm. Maybe they're trying to give Shiva's role to Mahakala. Or a role? I'm not entirely sure. It seems like they both have issues with the roles. I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> Let's just continue. In other words, both of these weapons are incomplete. A lone figure upon the battlefield concludes in a whisper. A fact I'm sure the warmongers are fully aware of. Which means this plan, Operation Mahakala, has not yet reached its final phase. Whew! This guy sure is heavy! Ugh. Well, you're literally carrying a cow. Ugh. And this is everybody, right? Okay. Only a few more minutes until we can close the shelter. T Tetsuya, wait! Can you make room for this guy? Kengo, many others who got here first are still waiting to get in. How about you just... Whoa. They really did a number on this guy. Who the heck is he? He said his name's Marduk. I think he's a m the member of the... Warmongers. Can't go. Probably should have left that part out, but whatever. What? Who are aware that all the world representatives are after you, aren't you, Arthur? You were a vessel, and we have fought and competed over that which you carry within you. Hmm. Why do I still don't understand why everyone wants a protagonist. Something about being a vessel or a sacrifice, or. It seems there's a different reason for everything, but. What's so special about us besides our 23 souls? What makes our 23 souls precisely so special? I'm not entirely sure. Of course, this must seem like a great injustice and an unwarranted misfortune on your part. You have my sympathies. However, I cannot deny that I share the same sentiment as my fellow representatives. You are someone I must defeat. And yet, even knowing this, you have chosen to aid me. Why? I've had enough of others suffering because of me. Friend or foe, it doesn't matter to me. Now stay still, your wounds. You need not worry over my condition. I have my own means of preventing my demise. Why didn't you say so earlier? Oh my god, just get forward already. <laughs> if I were to use the rule of my homeworld, Babylon, I could make it so that I was never injured to begin with. Uh, however... 
So you can heal yourself. And that's great. But... Mm, well... Mm -hmm. Never mind that. Listen to me, can go. And you, Arthur. <laughs> I love his red expression in his face. <laughs> no, nothing can change the fact you, that you are my enemies. However, the me who knows you in this moment will never forget the kindness you have shown him to the end of his days. <laughs> well, at least you're being nice about it. The other world reps just rushed us. Anyway, we can talk about this later after you've had time to heal yourself up in the shelter. Right, partner? Hold it, Kingo. You don't have the authority to decide who comes in here. What makes you think you'd let someone from the guild that bombarded Kamikicho into... Huh? Well, where are you going, Yerthen? Sorry, Tatsuya. I have to go. There's something I need to do. I'm going to try and talk to Mahakala. What? Hey! Wait up, partner! I'm coming too! <laughs> Your new partner's even worse at listening than you are, Kengo. Ah, shut up. You're the one who used to run around like a mad dog, Tetsuya. Ah, crud. I don't have time to, for, to be bickering with you right now. I'm coming, Arthur. Hmm. Anyways, uh... Marduk, was it? You said you can heal yourself, right? Shouldn't you be getting on with that before you bleed out? No. I cannot heal. I can only make it so that I was never injured to begin with. Not only these wounds, but also my memories will be reverted. The Marduk to whom you are talking now will be reborn in you. You what? It is time, Ashusu. Do it now, and make it quick. Oh my boy. <laughs> the dragon accompanying Marduk opens its mouth wide. <laughs> no way. And proceeds to swallow Marduk whole. It's a shame that he is probably not going to be a summoner leader because Mahakala looks pretty cute. Amid the boulders falling on Kabuki Show, however, is the exception Mahakala, entirely unruffled by the chaos around them. Mahakala! Are you the same Mahakala I met before? The one who possessed Mr. Mononobe? Greetings. It has been quite a while since our encounter Minnie's Penitentia, has it not? It is difficult for me to perceive how much time has passed on the surface. Hmm, regardless, know that I am generally glad to see you again upon this battlefield. Is that your true form? Before in Penitentia Academy. Ah, uh, yes. Last we met, I spoke to you through the barred voice and shadow of the one you called Mononobe. This is the true form of Mahakala, the protector of shadows. I guard those who have been abandoned by this world. That man was on the verge of ceasing to be, so I filled the void within him with my shadow and brought him under my wing. The fragments of the man's memories remain within me still. I want to see Mr. Mononobe right now. Please, let me speak to him. How oh, pitiful. You chase after the shadow of a ghost who ended his own role in this world. However, Arthur, you too must. Mahakala pauses, glancing at the ring on your finger. Mm, no, it is fine. I shall grant you this small mercy. Hmm. Mr. Mononobe, are you... That was actually not surprising we'd see him again. Arthur. Advent of the Great Darkness 2. There is one who has been worn down through Captain's loops. Allow me to tell you of that being. Our setting is a cyclical world destined to be destroyed and remade over and over again. The being of which I speak was given the role of omniscience to be all-knowing. 
to rule above all others and keep the world running. This being was given the highest position in the hierarchy. In other words, the being in question possessed a role as a world representative and was responsible for maintaining the world's order and operations. Hmm. Thus, this being saw the world begin and end through countless loops and watched over the lives of those who laughed, grieved, and died in that world. Now, when people meet and form a bond, conflict inevitably arises. Yet, if this world was to be maintained, somebody would need to pass judgment, distinguishing wrong from right. The few would need to be sacrificed to save the many. The system that makes this maintenance possible requires a being with knowledge of everyone who resides in that world. Furthermore, in order for this being to deduce the minimal sacrifice required, they must love all people, only one with a heart magnanimous enough to wish for the survival of all would be able to fulfill this requirement. Knowing someone is always the first step toward loving them. After all, if you deeply understood the motives and emotions behind another's behavior, would you not find yourself capable of loving them? Therefore, a being who knows all would be the only individual capable of loving all. This being would have to witness countless deaths and rebirths. They would have to suffer watching the people they know and love meet their end time and time again. Isn't such a burden unfathomable? What would it be like to have every last cycle of destruction burned into your memory? All that can be said of the being of whom I first spoke is this. One day, relinquishing the last drops of love yet felt for the world, the being disappeared. This is Deva Loka, a world inhabited by Devas. Are they talking about Varuna? Young Shiva was once trained here all alone, day after day, keeping his distance from his fellows. That is, until an arrow of light struck Shiva in the chest. This arrow was the embodiment of the rule that imparts love and desire, and was fired at Shiva by Varuna Kamadeva. Shiva knew all too well why this had to be done. The other devas had employed Varuna Kamadeva to carry out this deed. They had sought to teach Shiva how to love. They had sought to make Shiva, who refused to bond with anyone, fall in love with another. The devas' aim in doing these things was to ensure that their world order would be maintained. It was a plot to have Shiva become a world representative. Shiva knew all this the instant the air struck him and roared with fury. So the responsibility of being able to love everyone was given to Shiva? Uh, how dare you! He was enraged. Why should others be allowed to decide whom should he love or what he desired? Shiva was glad to be alone in life. He had no need for love. In his rage, Shiva opened his third eye, whose light is powered by a rule that can reduce whole universes to ashes. When the light dimmed, all he saw was scorched earth. Nothing remained of Varuna Kamadeva. So that's what they mean when he was completely oblit uh, uh, obliterated. Uh, when they mentioned earlier that uh, the Varuna was different from other uh, outcasts. Yet she even knew that this wasn't the end of Varuna Kamadeva. So long as Varuna Kamadeva's rule remained within Shiva, Varuna Kamadeva lived. Interesting. Moments after his third eye closed, Shiva was surrounded by an array of colorful lights. I wonder why, though. What they see in us. Why is Varuna even in us if uh, Varuna is obliterated? To settle the score with Varuna Kamadeva once for all, Shiva transferred to this Tokyo. He has since sealed his third eye. To him, it is nothing but a reminder of the shameful moment in which he gave in to his desires. Above all else, he seeks the strength to subdue the passion that Varuna Kamadeva awakened within him. 
Shiva soon came to learn that this Tokyo, much like Devaloka, is locked into a cycle. Creation, sustainment, and destruction continue to repeat here too. Life is born and destroyed alongside the world only to be reborn again, as an, inter as an entirely new being, devoid of all previous memories. Of course, this only applies to those who lie within the system of reincarnation. Those who keep the cycle turning are not allowed to forget. That is only natural, for if no one remained when the world came to an end, who would oversee its rebirth? Someone who remembers the deeds of the previous Yugo must remain to reanimate the world. This duty had worn Varuna down to the point of nearly vanishing from the world altogether. I see. So Varuna was... Varuna was, had the difficult responsibility of loving everyone, but after seeing everyone die over and over again, all, everyone he loved, he just could not like uh, bear to love anymore, so he gave the last of his, abil his ability, his passion, to Shiva. Seems that all his other abilities slipped before then, though. And Shiva understood that he has been, he had been the intended replacement. Upon arriving in Tokyo, Shiva joined a guild comprised of similarly battle-hungry people and dedicated himself to his training once more. But in this moment, Shiva is convinced that he was better off alone. He doesn't need the help of others. He does not care for the title of world representative. The arrow of light that struck Shiva earlier was not unlike the one Varuna Kamadeva once shot at him. Thus, the sensation reminds him of the vow he made that fateful day. He swore never to be in need of a bond with another. He vowed never to forgive and to destroy all in existence. Thus, Shiva now moves to sever all the ties he's ever made. And yet part of him wonders if this isn't exactly what the world intended for him to do so. He clears his mind of such uncomfortable thoughts with a shake of his head. <laughs> Gotta love this music. Shiva sweeps across the battlefield, his goal to annihilate all life in Ikebukuro. He is every bit the destroyer of worlds foretold by the faith of Devaloka, a being capable of mercilessly slaughtering friend and foe alike. <laughs> oh shit. <sighs> what is the meaning of this, Shiva? Hmm. Looks like uh, Tita and Corpica were casually battling it out, <laughs> completely unaware of the situation around them. <laughs> okay, I'm surprised that Tita wasn't brought into the situation. Marduk was kind of like the place total for, for, holder for the entire thing. Not even his fellow world representatives are safe from his wrath. <sighs> Shiva has begun attacking office of the warmongers. He's lost himself completely. Shiva's never gone so far in any of the previous loops. What do you think of Matarazu? Does that arrow shot by the reserve from Olympus have something to do with this? Reserve from Olympus? Reserve? What does that mean? Like, he's a replacement world representative? I believe so. That arrow embodied the rule that the same is the faith in Olympus. The rule that can deliver love into one's heart like lightning strike. However, while that arrow does seem to be the catalyst, I suspect it is not the root cause of Shiva's behavior. I can't believe uh, Shinya ended the world. <laughs> if that arrow had functioned as it should, Shiva would surely be chasing after the reserve who shot it right now. Now that you mention it, something does seem to have gone amiss. One reason why a rule may fail to activate, or activate properly, is that a similar, similar rules are in effect. This must mean that Shiva was already being influenced by some form of mesmerizing rule when the arrow shot him. Hmm. Well, whatever the reason for it, is this not exactly the sort of chaos that calls for our intervention? No. It is too dangerous. 
when you have to experience me that much. Our goal here is to ascertain what we can can of the warmonger's ultimate weapon. It is wisest that we stay at our hands for now. Very well. I cannot disagree with that. Come, my angels! Retrieve Corporate and the others. As you command! Engrave my name of Matarasu unto thee. Sacred artifact of Iwato. Shut out the light! The sacred artifact that Amaterasu summons conceals the Eastern Army in a place untouched by light. Hmm, I'm not sure who we're facing here, but it is a tall map. And there seem to be two bosses, so two faces most likely. Uh, maybe it's Marduk, I'm not sure. I, I think he's like wood type. Anyways, Advent of the Great Darkness 3. Alright, let's try this out. Ugh. Ugh. At last. It is quiet. Now that the light has gone and the battlefield is devoid of all movement, Shiva exhales a sigh of relief. He finds solace in the fact that he no longer has to face anyone who would have fought him for his inability to contain his aching heart. Now he can pursue the reincarnation of Varuna Kamadeva without regret. A monk in training must be noble and solitary. Shiva reminds himself that he cannot allow anyone to see him in such a shameful state. Just you wait, Varuna. Kamadeva reincarnate. I am coming for you now, Earthen. You know, for someone who got the ability, the rule to love and feel passion, like, <laughs> this guy's all about hate. What the heck? Shiva sprints south in the direction of Kabukicho. Where he knows you will be found. Hmm. Father! It's it's me! Little, little Simon! What's wrong? Talk to me! Father! Please! Answer me! Mr. Mononobe, what happened to you? Why won't you say anything? No matter how desperately you plead, there is no response to either of your calls. Do you not see the futility of this, Arthen? The words spoken through Mononobe's lips are not in the voice you are used to hearing in the classroom. This man is nothing more than a vessel to prevent his existence from snuffing out entirely. Did I not tell you all this during our meeting beneath Penichanchi Academy? Mahakala begins drawing information from Mr. Mononobe's memories, presenting you with fact after fact. This man has endured countless loops here in Tokyo. He was tasked with monitoring the loops in which you exist, Arthen. Oh. This has worn his spirit down to such an extent that he has become the wreck you see before you. I shall show you his memories as proof, for I am nothing if not merciful. So was this what you're talking? No, this is this is different, but it's very similar to Bruna, uh, Devaloka. Whoa. It's like a screen. Mahakala projects the fragmented memories they have drawn from Mr. Mononobe upon the shadows enveloping their form. How long has this been going on? How many times have I been through this with Arthen? How many times have all the memories and records been reset so that we can meet again for the first time? His death has become a lot less frequent since I made that creature named Lil Salmon accompany him. Do I not die in all timelines? 
I've become very adept at teaching and guiding students after having repeated the lesson so many times. I remember how, in earlier loops, I would let my emotions get the best of me, shouting at my students for their ignorance. No wonder Mr. Monomi seems like the perfect teacher. He has memories! Of course he'd know how to teach. That's so sad. I would even wail at them over the fact that they had lost their memories. Oh, no. But I don't think that will happen again. I'm pretty good at handling my emotions now. Those children call this business of repetition a game. They are the ones who monitor and record these loops. According to them, I am Arthen's overseer. My role is to monitor a single student from the inside and out, with the assistance of the demon known as Little Solomon. Once again, I find myself making my way to the library under the old school building. Okay, well that entirely explains how he was able to, like, uh, register us for the school the moment, like, we met him. So that's no longer a mystery now. This is where all the records of my previous encounters with students are kept, including those of Arison. The memories of all of those who live in this world are stored beneath Tokyo. In the Shinjuku Library. As I pour over these recorded memories, I think about how I am the only one who actually remembers any of these events. I take the ring from my shirt pocket, deciding to leave it in one of the books. I do this so that the ring will be found by the next person who comes here. This is the Ring of the Omniscient. It can be used to form contracts beyond worlds. Furthermore, it is this ring's rule that made extra-dimensional contact with Little Solomon. Arathen's copy, possible. With this ring, he could escape this world alone. I want that for him. Or Arathen. I am fully aware of how far gone my soul is at this point. I simply cannot endure him forgetting the memories we made together yet again. That memorable detention... Summer school. Those festivals we went together. How painful it is these events exist only in my memory now. And when they're reprinted. And I simply cannot stand to see him die another time. It has taken countless loops for him to fight against a world representative and survive. So these guys actually managed to kill them several times. Well, that's not a surprise. Nobody could have been more surprised and overjoyed at this development than me. Not even Arthen. Sadly, this ring is the only object in my possession I can give him. Or was it the first that we were actually able to, like, uh, not die by them? I'm not sure. I will not ask for freaking this. I only pray that he will outlive me. If I could tell him one thing, it would be this. Over the course of many loops, you've been able to make memories and bonds with everyone in this Tokyo. I want you to remember that. And one more thing. Please just... Forget about me, Arathen. There you have it. This is what remains of the memories he left behind in this world. Mr. Mononobi was monitoring me. And little Solomon, too. Hmm. I mean, yeah. I'm shocked. And angry, too. But more than that, I... 
I just didn't think you'd be so selfish. You can't say all that and disappear. As if I could ever forget you. You say that, but the fact of the matter is, you have forgotten many times already. I cannot fault you for it. It was, after all, inevitable. Though I must confess, I pity you. Everyone's memories has been lost. They were washed away by the tides of time, carried afar on the backs of countless loops. Not even those who call themselves world representatives have been able to hold on to their memories. What? I thought that was their whole basis, or at least some of them with pillars. Well, I know only some of them carry partial memories. Not even those who call themselves world representatives have been able to hold memories. We are so concerned about our own uh, memories in terms of how many times we've died in the past and how many times allies have betrayed us. They never really considered the feelings of those who were retaining their memories all this time. The pain that it entails. And yet some have endured fates far worse than any of yours. Why here is one now? Or have you not yet perceived the cruel fate creeping up on you? Is the Shiva? Oh, it's Marduk. Marduk! Standing right behind you is none other than Marduk. Oh yeah, he lost the memories. Whom he had just left at the shelter. Marduk! You're okay. I'm glad you're alright. There you are! I finally found you, vessel of the manifold dragon! Marduk is pointing his weapon at you with murderous intent. I am Marduk, hero of Babylon and slayer of the manifold dragon, Tiamat. The Marduk you see before you bears no trace of the wounds he had been suffering from only a short while ago. What's more, he's going at you with unprecedented ferocity. What a dark world this is that I have been thrust into. I haven't a clue what happened before my birth, but now that I have my target before me, there is one thing for me to do. Hold on a second, Marduk. What are you going on about? Just earlier we were... Silence! I demand that you fight me, here and now. No, it's not strong enough. Ow. Ow. Crap. Okay. He didn't take any damage from that. <laughs> But he's also not moving. Even though Kotaro attacked. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if we miss. Oh wait, he's gonna miss and then we're gonna get skill locked. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh, he's not moving. Okay, well, for now, let's just keep on hitting him. What is this piss ass damage? Oh, it's a survival quest! <laughs> I didn't even realize. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> I'm not paying attention carefully enough. <laughs> Oh fuck, we're still skill locked. Shit! Um. Well, I'm fucked. Too many more turns. Two more turns, fuck. Um, who has the most sauce right now? Beat those. Or Kotaro, actually. Well. 
it's fine because the thing is resistant. But I do need someone to take the hit. Alright. Right, we only have survivor. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so worried about trying to hit them. I just need to do this for a few more turns. Um, okay. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you, Kotaro. At least I can <laughs> attack them <laughs> very pedally, even though it's not really necessary in this quest. Marduk, Calf of the Sun, is a hero of Babylon and a world representative. He came to Tokyo with the role of a hero and is destined to vanquish a certain disastrous phenomenon. Yes, a phenomenon, not an individual. It is his task to avert the convergence of multiple worms. Worms are beings with immense powers. Were they to assemble in a single location, they would cause a cataclysm most terrible. Marduk's role is to restore order by tearing the many worms to pieces. And he does a good job with his skill kit. To accomplish this, and for being both a hero and an incarnation of the sun, Marduk was given the rule of rejuvenation and regeneration. This rule was provided by the faith that governs his homeworld of Babylon. It allows Marduk to be born anew when his body is perished. Once in his homeworld, Marduk fought Tiamat, who was at once the Manful Dragon, the Convergence of Worms, and his own ancestor. I... He called us the Manful Dragon, so we, I guess we are Tiamat then. Including the Convergence of Worms and his ancestor. Marduk slew Tiamat and tore the beast's body asunder, creating the earth and sky. They said that Marduk then went on to create the first humans from the blood and flesh of Tiamat's child, Kingu. Oh my god. Since Tiamat's blood flowed uh, within Marduk as well, he came to embody the same rule as the dragon possessed. This is why Marduk is able to be born again into a new body by having Mushusu, one of the runes he severed from Tiamat, swallow him whole. However, this process does not preserve his memories. He was born as an entirely new being every rebirth. Hmm. I'm not really sure how that logic follows of him being able to <laughs> be born and reborn, but okay. The sole remembrance that Marduk carries over to his new self is his role, which is engraved into the very fibers of his being. All he knows is that he is the hero who must track down and defeat the one within whom multiple, multiple worms lie dormant. Okay, well, we are that dragon, so. And we do have multiple souls, so. Let us fight! A fell keeper of worms! Uh! He's strong. I don't stand a chance. Besides, even if I did, I can't do this. He's a world representative, and. What are you playing at? 
This cannot possibly be your full strength. Marduk appears to have no memory of the events that transpired between you earlier. I don't want to fight you, Marduk. Please, stop this. It is clear that your words do not stir so much as a whisper uh, of remembrance within Marduk. He has no recollection whatsoever of the events that mean so much to you. To him, it is as if they never happened. He has forgotten them in their entirety. I guess this is how Mr. Monobi feels. It hurts to be forgotten. If you will not fight, then I will simply end you here. <laughs> What's gotten into you? This isn't like you, partner. Kango. Thanks, but... Who are you and what have you done with my Arthur? Where is the person who kept coming after me? No matter how many times I've told you to leave me alone. But... It can go, I... So what if you're being monitored by a teacher? I've had cheer on my back for over a decade. It doesn't matter what the others think or see in you. It's what you choose to do that counts. So? Come on! Tell me what you want to do, Arathen. I want to do all my teachers and classmates. I want to help Mr. Monombe to go back to school with everyone. I want to remind him of what he's lost. The park, the classroom, the dojo, or that, I think that's the office and the interior, the square. Sounds good to me. I'm behind you all the way. You know, I'm not exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. Uh, so I didn't get much of what you've been talking about, but... Just because something's lost doesn't mean it's gone forever. You just haven't found it yet. Maybe you don't know where to look. So even those memories really are lost. We just have to find them. Simple. And that idiot logic just might be stupid enough to be true, actually. These memories, right? Um, they're tangible things. I don't think we've ever mentioned about memories being destroyed. Just being lost. We might not know where they are now, but when we do find them, we'll be able to get them, give them right back. It'd be nice to get my own memories back, too. Can't go. You're right. I can't give up now. Even if we can't get it done in one go, we can always try again. If ten goes aren't enough, then we'll give it a hundred more. You've never the, given up before, so why start now? What happened to that person who chased after me every time I was down? You're normally the one saying this stuff. Since when did we switch roles, huh? Hey, what are you doing now? Not now. You trying to make a sitting ducks for the enemy? Jeez, oh, you're such a handful sometimes. <laughs> hey, my duke. I hope you're listening, because everything I just said applies to you, too. Hmm? If you forgot about what we did for you, then we'll try, try, and try again until we make you remember. You've got no idea how tenacious we can be. We'll make you sure you never forget us again. Switching roles? How interesting that you should use a turn of phrase that describes our objective so exactly. Switching roles. Searching between Defender and Destroyer? Mm hmm. No, he's referring to with Shiva. Switching roles. He wants Shiva's role. Oh my god, that's what it means. So that the Shiva, Shiva can actually finally use his power, maybe? Or maybe. I'm not sure. But either way, one of the rules will be unlocked as a result. Between Heaven and Earth 1, 